Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today's podcast features ex-mobster of the Gambino crime family. His name was Andrew D. Donato. Andrew and I talk about his early life and getting into crime. Then we talk about him joining the Gambino crime family. Andrew was a soldier in Nikki Carrazzo's crew. Nikki's crew had their beefs with all kinds of different guys. But one in particular that Andrew talks about is having beef with the Lucchese crew ran by Anthony Casso and Vic Musso. Andrew also talks about being very close with William Wilde Bill Catolo's son, William Jr. Andrew has many stories about his years in the Gambino family. Andrew would eventually become a government informant and change his life around. Please subscribe for more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Andrew's story. Hey, Andrew, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm really good, man. I'm really excited for this interview. I appreciate you taking out some time to come on. Yeah, yeah, it's my pleasure. You know, I was glad to talk with you and, uh, Let's see what we could do today. I, I'm enjoying this. Yeah. Well, uh, I've, for me personally, I've seen you all throughout YouTube on a lot of guys' um, YouTube channels and stuff. And then I've also read your book now. And I thought that was a really, really good book, a really good redemption story on top of that. I left a great review. It's all about your life story and the mafia. And you're around a lot of guys, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I started out young and, you know, fortunately, it, it, it ended in a, in a good way for me. You know, I had some friends of mine with their stories didn't end so well and uh so i'm i'm, I'm blessed on on that aspect of it and i'm grateful i'm very grateful yeah you know, no, where i am today yeah and that's what we'll, that's what we'll cover we'll go into your early life your your life within the mafia and then we'll go on to you know how you you know got onto this path of redemption and what you're doing now so okay. i think a good way to start is uh you know what was your early life getting introduced to crime and well, I mean, basically, my early life was, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in was, you know, entrenched in organized crime activity. I grew up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and um, we had a social club two doors away from my house, and there was another one on the corner. <laughs> so as a kid, I would, you know, see these guys that were friendly with my family. You know, my family has always had some sort of um, organized crime ties. You know, I had an uncle of mine who was a Genovese crime family captain many, many years ago. And so we knew a lot of the neighborhood guys and the friends that we had, even my father and my grandfather were on the like fringes of society, you know, those type of guys, knock around guys, so to speak. So it was normal for us. You know, so as a kid, you know, you didn't see any unnormal activity to you. It was normal to have these people in and out of the home, you know, up and down the street. They would see me out, out and about, you know, give me a dollar, give me ten dollars, whatever it is. And, and you knew who these people were. And as I started getting a little older, I started to become friendly with their children and then people like that. And then, you know, we would start talking. And my, my father went to federal prison when I was very young. My father was mm -hmm. away for a few years. And I remember going back and forth to the visits with him. I was very young. But you never forget those things. No, and, I wouldn't imagine. No, and then, you know, you know when you, you start to be, be in this activity and you see that everything is in that normal setting. So when you started, when I started, you know, putting my toe into it, you know, committing small crimes and petty things and stuff like that. There was nobody there to correct it. Instead of correcting it, you had people around you who were actually saying, hey, kid, what'd you do today? Let me see what you got. You know, that kind of stuff. It was like encouraging it without knowing it. They were encouraging the behavior. Right. But don't get me wrong, you know, as I grew up, I take full responsibility for the things I did. You know, nobody put me in that direction. But my father was absent for many years of my life. And so I grew up, you know, trying to help my mother in my teenage years. And, you know, my mother was, you know, single parent, taking care of three children. And I, all I remember is that school was never a big thing for me. You know, I was, I was, I never went to school. I was in the street trying to make money one way yeah. or another. And, you know, in the neighborhood, when we moved out of Williamsburg, we moved to the Canarsi section of Brooklyn. I might've been about 14 and I started you know, meeting guys who were associated with the Gambino crime family at the time. They were young like me, but they were like two, three years young, older than me. I was a little, I was a little younger. And, you know, they took me around them and we started committing crimes, robbing cars, you know, stealing tires off cars, you know, bumpers, you know, small stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, my, uh, my stepfather at the time, um, he had a work van. And I would take the van out at night. I would steal it from him. I would take it out at night. And we would go around stealing, like, T-tops, tires off cars, batteries out of cars, 
stuff like that. And we just take it to the local junkyard and we would get a few hundred dollars a night. And for two, three kids, it's, it's decent money. It's a lot, yeah, you know? for a 14-year-old. But it's a way to start. And yeah. then, uh, you know, we got our hands on, like, some credit card and things like that. We were going into stores, and we knew everybody in the neighborhood. So we had a guy who would do cash with us. We would give them the credit card, and they would bang out the credit card, and we would we would keep it. Say it was $1,000 on the credit card. They would keep 500 We would get 500 And then one day, um, one of my friends came to me and said, listen, he goes, each and every week we go up to East New York uh, to go see a friend of ours and he wants you to come up there. And, you know, my first instinct was that I did something wrong. Like, what did I do wrong? Like, did I, did I do something I wasn't supposed to? Yeah. I was kind of worried. Even though I never had any knowledge of the person, I knew who he was because on the block that I lived, I was friendly with his nephews. Anyway, his name was Nicholas Barrazzo. And he was the Gambino crime family uh, made guy at the time. And so when I went up there to East New York, he had a club on Pacific Street and Eastern Parkway. And I went there and I walked in and it was very surreal for me. And uh, I walked in, I introduced myself. And he was, listen, kid, just want to let you know, I know everything you're doing out there. And now you know your friends are here every week to come and see me. You're more than welcome to come with them. And you never know when you're around the street and you fall into a you know, situation where somebody challenges you on what you're doing or whatever, you could always tell them to come and see me, that you're friends with me, and you always <laughs> got a place to stay here. And that's how it started. Yeah. I, I would, I'll would. i go ahead. No, go right ahead, sir. I was going to say, so, I mean, you eventually had to prove yourself. I mean, when, while you met Nikki, I mean, he something had to stand out to him to be like, I want to meet this kid. And well, yeah. yeah. Was it your first pinch? Well, well, what happened was my first pinch was basically uh, me and another friend of mine named Tommy at the time. We were shaking down these guys at a bagel store, which didn't seem like much to anybody when I say it. But what happened was these guys were robbing at the time in the early 80s. They were robbing maybe two, three thousand a week out of the bagel store. So we were two young kids. I was like 15, 16 years old. So I was like, we went up to the guy and we told him, listen, we know what you're doing. We want a piece of it. So me and Tommy were shaking them down for like 500, 600 a week, which wasn't big money, but it was a, a way to get in the door. And unbeknownst to us that this guy was one of Nikki's customers who owed money for gambling. Huh. And um, funny story, a good, you know, a guy that who I wind up growing up with in the life, his name was Mike Yanani. Mike Yanani comes up to me and Mike was maybe two years older than me. And Mike goes, listen, kid, you can't shake these guys down no more. You know, you want to go and shake somebody else down, that's fine, but you can't shake these guys down. And I was upset at the point because I was like, why can't I shake these guys down? Did, you know, and don't get me wrong, I'm not being a racist, but to me, they were like, they were two Jewish kids from the neighborhood. They're like, like, what kind of ties did they got, like, in my head, you know? Right, right, right. And um, as it turns out, they told me why, and I still didn't like it. And, um, but I did stop. I stopped. And because I stopped and was doing that, other doors opened. They were allowing me to do other things. So when I started stealing and doing like burglaries and stuff like that, they would help me. And in turn, it got to Nikki what I was doing in my activity. And then he had told me to come around. And now as I started getting older, my crime activity started to grow. We started to do more and more crimes. You know, we went to chop shop situations where we rented a space. And we were robbing two or three cars a night, shopping them during the day. And that became a full-time job for me. And we made really, really good money in the stolen car business. And we would drop one of those cars to uh, legends in the car business, guys like Patty Testa. When he was alive, we were dropping cars off to Patty. And we were dropping cars off to junkyards in the area, in Foster, area, Foster Avenue in, in Canarsie. And we were selling them packages. And... It just started to, we were able to use the resources, Nikki's resources at the time, to reach out to certain guys all around to expand the money that we were making. And it turned out to be really, really lucrative for us. And we were young, and I was the youngest of the bunch. So for me, I was making a few thousand dollars a week, and I was like 17 years old. I was making like three, 4,000 a week. So hmm. it, a lot it of was money actually, for a young kid. Yeah, for a young kid, it's, it's big money. So, you know, once you start to see that kind of money, you never wanted to stop. You know, oh, hell no. 
I would imagine so. And I mean, you just kept going and going and going. And it yeah, exactly. Then I started, you know, shaking down drug dealers in the neighborhood. Guys that that I knew who were like selling marijuana or selling cocaine or whatever it may be. And then I started shaking them down. And then what we would do is we would give Nikki a piece of that money once a month, or the money that we were shaking down. And and then what we were doing was we were networking the drug dealers. We were taking. Uh, a guy who was selling pot and then he might have ran into a drought telling us that he couldn't pay us that week. So we would go to another guy that we were shaking down and make sure that he would give this guy the product so we can continue to take money from him. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so we started networking them. And, um, and then it got to the point where I never even had to look for these guys anymore. They were coming to me saying, listen, I'm thinking about opening up a spot. I just want to come to you first. And we want to just let you guys know this way we can come up with some sort of financial agreement up front. And that's how it started to work. And yeah. uh, and being around Nikki was was a really, really great lesson for a kid who was going to be in that life. Because Nikki was born to be in that life. And being around him, I learned so much about the workings of organized crime settings and who not to be around and who not to go near and what spots not to rob and stuff like that. But, you know, other times it was trial by fire. You know, we would get in trouble for doing things we weren't supposed to be doing. And that happened quite often where, you know, we would, you know, get a little too zealous and we'd be out there and, you know, robbing spots we weren't supposed to be robbing or, you know, weren't supposed to be going near because he was a protected guy. And, uh, you know, Nikki would have to sit down for us and stuff like that. And, you know, so, we would get spanked for it, you know, so to speak, and, you know, punished for it. But it was a learning lesson. Yeah. I mean, so he was, Nick, Nikki was your mentor and he was the made guy that you had an end with because he, he would go on to be a capo because you were in his crew. Yes. Yes. So with Nikki, he was your made guy. So, I mean, he would go to bat for you. I mean, you were the exactly. associate of him and he just made sure, hey, I mean, if you're getting in trouble, he's got to be the one to go sit down. So, I mean, that's and through your yeah. book. I mean, that's what happened. A lot of that. Yeah, and, exactly. And then and, what would happen was anybody who was around Nikki or knew Nikki, if they needed something done and it wasn't something too serious, he would send the young guys. He would send us. So if yeah. somebody needed to get a beaten or somebody needed to get, you know, threatened or something like that. He would send us and mm -hmm. we would go, we would do it for him or whatever. And then as we started getting older, I started to get into bank robbery activity. I started to get into uh, Shylock and money. And I started to get into other aspects of crime. And I started to deal with other crime families as well, based off those friendships. Right. And because, you know, growing up, you know, I had guys that I grew up with, I went to school with who they wind up being with the Lucchese family or they wind up being with the Colombo crew but we still remain friends. So whenever somebody has something or stolen property or goods that they wanted to get rid of, we all network with each other, of course, because we've been friends for so many years. So, and that helped me because I was able to earn with every different crime family. Yeah. But as long as you knew where your flag flight at the end of the day, as long as you knew at the end mm -hmm. of the day that you went back to Sorrento, so to speak, that was Nikki saying, as long as you come back to Sorrento at the end of the night, to share the monies and the proceeds of what you're stealing, then it was worth it. You know, yeah. just as long as you knew your flag fly, that was the most important aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, that's true because, uh, like I told you, I had partnered up with Sal Polisi, and his whole thing that he did was, he, you know, he would do heists and different stuff with the five families, and he was under the Colombo, he was an associate of the Colombo family, and at the end of the yeah. day, he was with them. And you're right. I mean, they still had to get permission and get different, make sure it was okay with the other families, but it was not an uncommon thing for the families to work together and do heists and bank robberies and all that kind of stuff. Well, so, you got to remember, you know, you only have each other to lean on, you know, it's, it's us against law enforcement, Yeah. you know, when you lean off each other so that this way you can get away with these activities without getting pinched that's the that's the biggest thing of all mm -hmm. so we all would rely upon each other and if you had a resource or something that somebody else could tap into to help them you do it you offer it up to them you know this way that they can get you know free access and free passage as well um you know and then as i got older i got into a, a bank robbery crew of guys that i was robbing with and it was so weird because we had one guy from the colombo crew one guy from the Genovese, two guys from the Genovese crew, yeah, me from the Gambino crew, 
you know, so we were all from different families. So when we would go to plan robbery or do something like that, we all had our rabbi, so to speak, or who we had to go turn our money into. So everybody would be like, okay, I got to put money aside for this one, money aside for that one. And every once in a while, you know, we would have to have a sit down or something or whatever it may be. But it all worked out, you know, in the long run, it all worked out because it's all about getting the money at the end of the day. I mean, that's what it's about. And we were pretty good at it. Yeah, no, I mean, you did. You were a, a soldier in the Gambino family for 15 years. Yeah, it was about yeah. 15 year run. And then then I went away. I, I spent a lot of time in prison. I did two stints in prison, I did one in state and one in federal. What was um, your first one? Because I know you went to prison and, you know, there was a whole thing with your lawyer wanting to be paid right away. And uh, yeah, you, you, that you, was that was when I was really, really young. That was that was back in 1988. Okay. And um, I. That was my first time away. I went away for an attempted murder charge. I shot someone. And um, I was I was having trouble with the attorney. The attorney at the time was getting ready to become a judge. He was um, he was one of those guys who was making the transition. He was a mm -hmm. very good lawyer. Yeah. He was making the transition to try to become a judge. And um, with me, I was paying this guy for months and months and months. And it, it was tough because I had just had, my son was just born. I had just got arrested. I'm paying the lawyer. I can't really be out in the open committing these crimes anymore because I'm out on bail. Um, I'm trying to navigate through this all and do this, still trying to take care of my family without going back to prison during being out on bail. And, but I'm a criminal. There's nothing else that I know. It ain't like I have a regular job. So I have to figure out how to earn during this time period. So I'm loaning money. I'm still shaking on the drug dealers. I'm doing stick ups, whatever I can do. And I was surviving that aspect of a big chunk of what I was making was going to, towards the attorney. And then when I went to the pre trial motions, I had, was supposed to give him like 10 or 12,000. I forget what it was. And I was short. I didn't have enough money. And um, he went in front of the judge and he told the judge, I want to be taken off the case because he's not living up to his financial obligation. And I got to be honest with you. I wanted to beat him half to death in that courtroom right there. It took every ounce of energy in me not to hurt this guy. He really did. Because here I was. I mean, he didn't know it, but I was going through changes to try to pay this man. I legitimately was out there doing stick ups to pay this man. Damn. And so I had a big fight with him out in the in the hallway. And I was with my father at the time. And it got really, really heated. And um, so I walked away. The judge actually took him off the case. I had to wind up getting, um, I, had, I got another attorney. And now all that money was wasted. And I wind up blowing trial on the case. I blew trial. And I got a five to 15 year sentence, which which was a break because I got to get eight and a third to 25. I could have got the max, but I wind up the judge sentenced me in the middle somewhere. So I got lucky with that. Mm -hmm. And um, I came out and then when I came out after doing the five year bid, I was off to the races. I, I was back in the street robbing again within 24 hours of getting released. I didn't waste any, I didn't waste any time because in my mind, this is who I was. I was a part mm -hmm. of this. And. They welcomed me back in with open arms, you yeah. know, because they knew I was going to be out there earning again. And um, and I didn't know anything else. And it was right. sad because I didn't I didn't have a chance. I really didn't have a chance. Yeah. And I mean, so when you got out, I mean, that that is, uh, you know, something to go away for for quite a while. And you, you got, you know, a pretty good break on that case. And. And then when you came out, you know, it's just like straight back to it. Like you said, 24 yeah, hours, you just 24 <laughs> hours later, um, 24 hours later, I think we, we, we robbed a, a bunch of gold watches from one of the department stores. We had a guy, we had a connect. We wound up doing that score. And then I don't know. I think I was, uh, I did a bank burglary. I did about a month after that. I was, we did a bank burglary and, um, I had some friends of mine from a different crew inside the Gambino crime family who helped me. They took care of me. And mm -hmm. uh, my friend Sal and uh, this kid Tommy from, uh, from Bensonhurst. And they took me around with them and they introduced me to the bank burglary aspect, of which I never had no knowledge of. You know, usually if we were going to do something, it was going to be a strong arm robbery. And um, 
they turned me on to that and I was able to earn. And um, I was in trouble again within about 14 months of being home. I was back on the run. I went back on the run. A friend of mine was murdered. And when my friend got murdered, I uh, I absconded from parole because they were they were questioning me about the homicide. And I had did so much dirt during that time period. I wasn't going to stick around to see what they actually wanted to speak to me about. Mm-hmm. So I wound up running out of parole. It was so it was such a weird situation. I was in parole in Staten Island, and uh, my parole officer had called me in for a special meeting, which my antennas went up because I had just seen him like a few days before, and he told me he had to do some paperwork and he had to strain out some stuff just to come in. He'll have a few questions for me, and that was it. Another friend of mine who was part of Nikki's crew happened to be on parole too. His name was Mario Casarino. Mm-hmm. And Mar- Mario comes up and Mario tells me, he goes, listen, kid, he goes, you got to get the fuck out of here. He goes, I'm downstairs getting something. I'm getting coffee. And there's two fucking FBI agents downstairs. And they're talking about you. They're going to come up here. They're going to pinch you. I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. So now I'm stuck. If anybody knows the parole officer Staten Island at the time, you had to get buzzed in and out. You, weren't, you couldn't just walk out. So I sat there and I was like strategically trying to plan how to get the fuck out of there. So... The long and short of it is the two FBI agents come up, they ask my parole officer, I am the only man standing. Mario's already went in to see the parole officer. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting in the office by myself. The two the two agents are waiting for my parole and they both turn around and look at me. I look at them and I know they're there for me. Soon as they got buzzed in to go see them, I just got so lucky. Somebody else got buzzed in. When they got <laughs> buzzed in, I made a run for the door. I took those stairs three at a time. I busted out of there. I jumped into the car, I drove away, and then um, my lawyer was Jojo Carrazzo, which was Nikki's nephew. Damn, okay. And, and I reached out to Jojo on the phone, I let him know that I ran away from parole. I said, Jojo, we gotta find out what it is that they're there for. We, we need to find out what it is. I mean, because collectively, it could have been just about anything. It could have been a bank robberies, it could have been extortion, it could have been, you know, the question to me about my friend's murder. It could have been anything, but yeah, could have wanted to be there because they could hold you for 90 days on Rikers Island just just for shits and giggles, you know? Yeah. So, and I was making great money then. I didn't want it to stop. So, um, Jojo called up the parole officer, and the parole officer told him, listen, we don't know what you're talking about. The parole officer lied. So, Jojo said, okay, listen, if you're going to lie to me, you're not going to tell me why you were looking for my clients today. He says, good luck to you. You find them then. And Jojo hung up on him. And I went on the run. I was on the run for, I don't know, 14, 14 or 17 months. I forget what it was. And I wound up getting pinched about 14 months later. But during that time period, I just went on a mad crime spree. I was robbing anything that moved. Yeah, um, it, I think one of them, you were, were you at the time, you were doing an auto shop shop business while you were yeah. on the run? So Yeah, well, I was on the run. I, was, I had my hand into everything. We were doing drop-off cars, so anybody who's ever stolen a car before knows what that is. We were doing drop-offs, so I would drop off two cars a night for guys. I was making like 500 a drop-off, which wasn't a lot of money, but when you're on the run, it keeps you afloat. Yeah, I would uh, imagine. And Roy, Roy DeMeo was one of the guys you had encounters with in this particular uh, chop shop business? Oh, what happened was, um, on, well, we were chopping cars when we were younger. Um, we were chopping cars, unbeknownst to us, we were chopping cars that were going to the Patty Testa crew and those guys. And then um, Roy, and the, Roy was already dead. This was like 1983. Roy was already dead, but we were still chopping for those guys. They had a real good connect where they were selling cars to Kuwait. They were chopping cars, and they were getting dropped off cars and stuff like that, and you were putting them on a ship container mm-hmm. and sending them out to Kuwait. That was right about the time period when I got involved with it. Mm-hmm. They were already pinched at the time. There was already a case. Oh, um, that had already stopped, but we were, but we were working for them for Patty. Patty had a, 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 a used car lot on Foster Avenue in Canarsie, so we were doing work for Patty every now and then whenever he needed the car to be stolen or whatever. And Patty had a few guys to reach out to, so he would reach out to Beansy, who's an older guy in my in, in our crew, and Beansy was the connect between us and Patty. And then, uh, then we got to know them on that level. We would drop off cars and do stuff like that. And then we had our own shop and we were doing our own work and guys would come to us. So I was trying anything at the time to make money. 
but when I was on the run, going back to that other situation, I was doing the drop offs and then uh, I was still shaking down drug dealers. I had a, I had a few guys who were paying me like fifteen hundred a week a piece, and I had like three or four guys, so I was making a few thousand dollars a week with that. And then um, the guys who who I was robbing with with the Genovese crew and with the uh, Colombo crew and the Banana crew, those guys brought me in, and a guy in their crew was dying of cancer. And they said, listen, Drew, we need a new guy. And I told them the truth. I said, listen, guys, I'm on the run. I got the FBI looking for me. I got the state below looking for me. I got, you know, I got New York State Police looking for me. I said, if you want me to do the work, which I will, but understand that I'm wanted. I can't be hanging out in social clubs. I can't meet you, whatever. So they welcomed me in, and they did that, and we made some really decent money. And we did a bank robbery. The first one that I did with them, we did a bank robbery in uh, Manalapa, New Jersey. We robbed the bank on um, Labor Day weekend. And we, we got a half a million dollars out of there. And I was on the run, so it, it hit just right. Damn, and, um, man. Five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, it saved me. Hold on that a is, second. There's a man shooting over my head here as I speak to you. Yeah, no, I can hear, man. No, yeah. I mean, but so, no. Um, so that really did, did, but that robbery was pretty good. We had a friend of ours who lived in the area, and um, he used to go collect. He used to go and cash his uh, social security check there. And every Thursday, he would notice that he would see a, a truck, a Brinks truck, drop off bags and bags of money at this location and they didn't have no partition it was just a regular desk at the bank where you could jump over <laughs> and he said Nothing. that he, he said on a busy day they never put the bags in the vault they would put the bags behind the desk and they would leave them there for later so what we did was we followed the truck two weeks in a row and then on the third week we said this is the week we're going to do it because it was a holiday weekend and we knew that the Anybody who's followed a bring truck before in their life would know that on a holiday weekend, it's, the money's going to be doubled. So say it's a score where you're expecting like two or three hundred thousand, it's going to be six, eight hundred thousand on a holiday weekend because they're going to load up the ATM machines and stuff of that nature. And um, so we followed the truck on this week. We waited in the parking lot. We knew what time they would be there. I, uh, I waited for the truck to come. I waited for the delivery driver to go in. As soon as he went in, as soon as he came out, I walked in. I walked in. I had a baseball hat, sunglasses on. I jumped over the counter. A few people screamed. I pulled the two bags up. They were right behind the counter like my friend Paulie said they would be. I pulled them up. Then there was a good Samaritan in the bank. He starts running towards me. Hmm. And he didn't notice I had somebody else in the bank with me. And they caught him right across the floor and they grabbed him. And I don't know if it was adrenaline or what you might call it, but he got thrown and it seemed like he went halfway across the bank when he got thrown. Oh and um, we wind up taking four bags from them at the time. I think it was four bags we got out of the bank. There was some lady walking in the bank at the time. And when she was walking in the bank, she seen us coming out with the bags. She starts screaming. So she starts running out of the bank screaming. We go behind the bank. We get in the car. We got the police scanners on us. We get to... My friend lived about a minute from the bank, not even, right down the road. We go down the road, and on the police scan, and we could hear that the first description that they had of us was that a man and a woman robbed the bank because they seen her run out first. What the hell are you serious? Witnesses, <laughs> witnesses seen her run out first. That she, they thought she, she was did. my accomplice. Oh, and my God. So she runs out first. They wind up pulling this lady off, over on, on Route 9. They take her to a police barracks. And uh, we're in the house. We're hearing this on the scan, and we're laughing hysterical. This poor lady's her whole life got turned upside down. And um, we stood in the house for like six, seven hours. We ordered some food. And then um, once we thought the coast was clear, you know, there'd be no roadblocks or anything like that. Because we seen it on the, new, on the news. They had it on the local news. They showed the bank roped off and everything. And um, we waited. I took a shower, shaved, changed my clothes. And then we all drove back to Staten Island. I drove in a different car with my friend's wife. This way, I wouldn't be in the same car where the money was being. I was the upfront guy. I'd be in a separate car. This way, we don't get, you know, 
they don't right. get me and the money. Yeah. And I met my friends in the, on the New York side in Staten Island, and we all divvied up the money there. And then I went home, and I went and enjoyed my weekend just like anybody else. But me, I couldn't enjoy it like everybody else because they could all go to their houses. I had an apartment in um, uh, Manhattan Beach, Brooklyn, that nobody was supposed to know about, but unbeknownst to me, about, I want to say, four or five months after that robbery, the FBI wound up getting the location, and I wound up getting pinched anyway. <laughs> Damn, just like that. I mean, so when they did pinch you, did they find all the bank money? No, 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 no. What happened was, was, you know, I took all the bands off the money, I burned them, anything like that. Anything that could possibly put me near the bank, I, uh, I burned. You got so, rid of it all. <laughs> I got rid of it all. Yeah. And, okay. um, but they did take everything I had, whatever I had, they took. And then yeah. they searched, they searched my mom's house as well. So whatever little bit of money I had there was taken. Mm -hmm. So during all this time while you were on the run, did, uh, was this where the beef happened with the Lucchese family, like Anthony Castle and their crew? No, no, that was years earlier. Um, years earlier. Yeah, it was years earlier when Anthony Castle was on the street. Um, this was like 1980, I want to say. The beef with Anthony Castle was he was still just a made guy at the time. Him and Vic Amuso, they weren't running the family yet, but they but they were up there. You know, Giz was a huge earner, and uh, everybody knew that Giz was a, a loose cannon. Yeah, listen, that guy, you know, he would dream about people and just look to kill them. But <laughs> yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, yeah, it got really, really intense. And I walked out of it very, very lucky. He did send somebody. Somebody did claim they shoot it. They shot at me one night. And uh, I'm standing outside a bar. And uh, I just happened to be talking to Nikki Carrazzo when it happened. And Nikki was sitting inside the car. And the first bullet hit the windshield of Nikki's car. Damn, that close. They got really, yeah. really close. So I pushed they didn't even Nikki's, know. Yeah, I pushed Nikki's head down. I started running towards the shooter, and I started shooting at him. He started running down the block, but he had, you know, he had a head start on me about 60 yards, 50 yards. Mm -hmm. So I started chasing him, so I, I knew I couldn't catch him, but I seen the car in the distance down the block with the lights off, and I seen it was backing down the block. So I just started throwing shots at it, but I couldn't get him. So what happened was um, when when they had to wind up having to sit down over it um, because we went out and shot them up a few days later, uh, Gas and Vic wanted to sit down. Unbeknownst to them, they wanted they wanted they were like looking for my head during the sit down, which they might have got at one point, which you couldn't trust Gas might regardless because even if he asks to kill you and he doesn't get the permission to. He might sneak me. I mean, the guy's yeah. very capable of coming and sneaking you. you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, but the thing that saved me was that he didn't know that Nikki was in the car when the gunfire went. And um, when Nikki told him about that he was the guy in the car, Gas knew that he had no wins during that argument. So I wind up, you know, living to fight another day, so to speak. Yeah. But I always, I always kept in the back of my head that if Gas still wanted me dead, Nobody's going to stop this guy from sending somebody. No. And, uh, no so I always thought about it. I really did. I always thought about it. I, I never went to sleep thinking that that was ever over, honestly. Really? Yeah, because, I mean, he was yeah. a really, really, really feared guy and or, or like a, you know, just a wild card. I mean, it didn't matter what you. It didn't matter. He was a wild card 100%. And, um, but you know what? I gave him a lot of credit while he was in the street because if you wanted to be in that life, you actually had to be like him, where you had to be ruthless to keep the wolves away from you, and you had to be a great earner. And he happened to be two. He happened to be both of those things, which is very hard. Yeah. It's very, very hard to be both. It really is. And he was able to do both of those, uh, <laughs> you know. But yeah, uh, because but, but then he got but then he got really he went off the rails at the end. He went off the rails. Yeah, and I mean, he would later on to go go and cooperate with the government as well. So, I mean, it's just uh, all all around a treacherous life, man. <laughs> yeah, it really, really is. I mean, like we were talking about, I was talking with somebody the other day, and they were talking about like what guys are doing today. 
I feel bad for the guys who are out there today because 20, 25 years ago, you couldn't trust nobody. Today, you can't trust a soul. No, who are you going to trust today when you got bosses and all these other guys cooperating with, cooperating with the government? You, like the guy you're turning in money to. It's probably been on payroll with the FBI for 20 years now. You just don't know. How do you beat, how do you beat that system? You just don't know. So, you know... I, to me, it wouldn't be worth it because there's really nothing left out there. You know, unless you have a construction company where you're shaking down construction people and you're making money on the down low or whatever. Other than that, you're not going to reinvent the wheel here. There's really nothing left out there. All no. the fishing spots have been fished out. You know that, right? Yeah. And I think another good topic would be talking about is uh, you're very close with Wild Bill's son, and you also would go on to have somewhat of a beef with Wild Bill. Yeah, and, and you know what, and, and it just, I always had, knew, I had so much respect for, for Wild Bill. I really did. I knew Wild Bill since I'm a very young guy. Um, I used to go, I had a, I had a friend of mine who used to live next door to Wild Bill on East 80, on East 38th Street in Brooklyn. And even his kids, everybody knew who Billy was, you know, and I, I see him all the time there. And... Little Billy, which I knew him as Little, Little Billy at the time, because I'm a few years older than Billy. Oh, okay. Um, so what happened was I was always getting in trouble, this, that, the other thing. I was already wouldn't keep doing my thing. But every time I see Billy's father, he was always kind to me, he was always nice to me, and, you know, asked me how I'm doing, has everything going, and he knows that I'm in the street. And uh, but he, he generally can't. He was, he was just a really good guy. And... Um, and then when Billy got a little bit older, I remember I was away on my first sentence for the shooting. And the, my friend who lived next door to Billy comes up to visit me, and Billy came with him. And Billy came and sat down at the table, and we were talking. He said, listen, you come home. He said, you know, you can come, come hang out. My father would love to see you. This, that, the other thing, you know, just that. And, you know, that's how the friendship started to really, really grow. And... We had a lot of history, you know, and there was a lot of history. So when I came home, you know, me and Billy spent a lot of time together. You know, we would bang around, we would go out, you know, we would go out to the city together, and you know, we would go to you know ball games and hang out, you know, like you would do. And I would go to his father's club once a week. I would go to see them. I would go to visit them, and you know, they had a dinner once a week. I think every Wednesday they used to meet over there on Eleventh Avenue in Brooklyn. And I used to go pay my respects to them, go say hello, because when I came home from prison. Billy and his father were the first two people to help me financially. Not even your crew. Not even my crew. Nikki Krauser didn't give me a fucking nickel. Damn, the man. guys in my crew did, like, you know, Mike and Beansy and those guys, they did help me. But Nikki, my boss, not a fucking, not, not a dollar. Not Damn. a dollar. But it is what it is, you yeah. know. Um, but uh, so, uh, so there was a nice friendship there. And my friendship with Nikki was kind of strained because um, there was a guy on my case who testified against me in my first trial. And there was a, there was a not an argument, but I was mad at my friends because my friends didn't do the right thing for me. And I had, I had taken care of witnesses and tampered with cases that they were going to have with witnesses. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we were in the street together, you know, two o'clock in the morning when the chips were down, Nikki wasn't going to come out of the house to help them. Who were they going to call? They were going to call me. <laughs> we You'd the be there. Together. Yeah. Yes. We were in the street together as kids and we went through a lot of shit together with, you know, fighting other crews and sticking together and doing mm -hmm. all of this. And then here you are. When I needed you, when my hands are cuffed and I'm locked down, and here we are, we're supposed to be family, yet you're going to allow me to walk the guy who testified against me. You're allowing this guy to walk in the very streets where we are each and every day. Yeah. So when I came home, I put in a beef about it. Mm -hmm. Only for the fact that I said my exact words were, Nikki says, if you're going to blame anybody, kid, you blame me. I put a stop to it. And he said, the reason why I put a stop to it is that we were dealing with a lot of issues here in the family. 
Now, if you're going to be a part of the family, you need to understand this. The family is bigger than you and me. He goes, so that means if you have a personal gripe or thing, it has to go on the back burner so we hmm. can take care of certain things. Yeah. He goes, so if you can't understand that, too bad. He goes, but now that you're home, we can take care of it. And I told him, I said, well, I got news for you. I says, I love you. I'll do anything in the world for you. I says, but I needed you when my hands were cuffed. This is a dance I could do myself. I don't need anybody to do this. This mm -hmm. I could do myself. And as it turns out, I started committing crimes and getting in trouble doing my own thing. And uh, I got in so much trouble, I wound up being on the run not too long after being home. And I was right back in trouble again. So that never came to fruition. And I'm glad it didn't because that guy who testified against me in my first case was a childhood friend of mine. And yeah. now that I've changed my life and moved on, it would have haunted me, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved in a lot of violence. Don't get me wrong. And anybody who knows me knows it wasn't about me pulling the trigger because I would shoot you in your fucking face in a heartbeat. But the bottom line is, is that I didn't want the life no more, brother. I really didn't because yeah. it was it was never good. You know, I lost all the years of my son growing up. Um, I, I realized that I was expendable to these people and it broke my heart. It really, really did. Um, yeah, I can on the short list. They were going to kill me and it, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, people, you know, who don't know anything about their life will say, you know, but that's the life you chose. You should understand that that comes along with it. Listen, when you sit here and you're loyal and you do all these things, it still doesn't guarantee, guarantee you safe passage. Because oh, people man. get killed every every day for the smallest things. They get they get killed because the guy wants your money, or you get killed for jealousy, or because you're a threat, or whatever it may be. Yep. And I just and I just knew I couldn't win because Nikki was the boss at the time, and he was taking over the family. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I could not win that battle. That even if I went out in a blaze of glory, there would always be somebody else to have to deal with. Oh and yeah, always. I mean, so this was yeah, this I mean, was right. my way. I couldn't yeah. win, brother. I really couldn't win. And you know what? I left the streets behind me, and I moved on with my life. And that was the scariest time, the scariest moment of my life is when I moved on. Yeah. I was scared to death. What? What? Uh, I really was. What were the events? Being that... a citizen was the scariest thing in the world for me. I'm sure it was a whole different life from I never living had where a, you live. I never had a real legitimate job. I didn't know how to reinvent myself. It was a struggle each and every day, but I did it slowly but surely. I did it. I went to work. I never looked back. And I'd be lying to you if I told you I didn't go through the highs and lows because I did. I had some really, really lean times. Really, really lean. But yeah. I survived. Now I do very well in the business that I'm in. And uh, I'm very happy. I really, really am. I'm happy. Yeah. I don't regret the decisions that I made because it turned me into the man I am today. And I'm happy with it because now at least I can be the brother and father and uh, son that I should have been from the very beginning because when I was younger I thought that money was being a man mm -hmm. being having money and taking care of your family that's right. only a very small portion of it but yeah. I remember home for my family I was in the street 24 7 and I was in jail half my life and so what I'm doing is breaking the hearts of the people who love me most and so it, it was a good turn of events for me it really really was and um, so I'm happy where I am right now it, I, I would imagine so because it's a whole different life to to you know from that to going legit and trying to deal with it on a daily basis and fighting the urges to wanting to get in a fight or wanting to do a crime or whatever it may be but i mean you saw the light you got out of it and now you're you know you're you're you still got a lot to live you still got a lot of a lot of time left you know what i mean so you got a lot yeah of and then you know when i got lucky i had a, I had a health scare about two years ago oh really and uh I had a, had a major operation on my back, and um, I got lucky because mm -hmm. I had a tumor on my spine, and I wind, up, I wind up surviving, and I got 195 stitches in my back, oh, didn't man, man. walk for seven months, um, and um, but somebody up there likes me because, yeah. you know what, I got through it, now I could do everything you can do, and I'm happy. You know, I could run, I could do whatever. Yeah. And uh, God bless me in that in that way. So I live to fight another day yet again, 
And that's why I don't take anything for granted. I'm very blessed and I'm grateful. I really yeah. am. I'm grateful more than anything else. Yeah. I don't take anything for granted. I live, I literally live each day like it's my last brother because I should have been dead 30 years ago. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're very lucky to be here and be able to tell your story. And like, like me and you talked off air, hopefully it, it helps people that may be going through that and want to get out. Yeah, of life. You know, you never, you never know. Listen, you're not going to touch all these people because you get, listen, Jesus can come off the cross tomorrow and there'd be somebody to criticize him. Oh yeah. The bottom line is, is that you go and you just try to do one good thing in your life. Just try to do it. If you can do it, you do it. If it helps one person, Mission Great. accomplished. Right. That's exactly. it. You know, but the whole idea is you you gotta live it. You gotta actually really wanna do it. You know, yeah. and oh. and I try it each and every day. And it's not easy, kid. It's really not easy. You know, there's many a times when I'm faced up against it financially, you know, you you wanna make things easier for yourself, but you can't. Mm -hmm. yeah. You just gotta keep on you gotta take it on the chin. You really legitimately gotta take it on the chin. No, you're 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 absolutely right, man. And I think uh with your words of encouragement and you know, when people are ready that's when they'll start listening. I mean, you, you can tell people all this shit. I mean, okay, imagine trying to tell this to yourself 30 years ago or whatever. Hell no, I mean, I would have, we'd be it. rolling on the floor right now. Me and you'd be yeah. fist fighting. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Look, you but hit it right on the head. Just like anybody else who, you have to be ready. It has to be something that you want, something that you've really been dying for. You have to realize that other people have done it and it can be done. But it is not easy. You got to be willing to walk down that road and, you know, make the best of it. Yeah. Because I'm still right. a work in progress, kid. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm still even, you know, for the till the day they put me in the ground, it's going to be a work in progress. Yeah. I mean, because it's reversing all the shit that you grew up yeah. doing. <laughs> or, you <laughs> so, know, or your, or your reaction to things, you know, yeah. you know, because That's my true. reaction to things is always, you know, it was always violence first, you mm -hmm. know, because where I come from. That speaks, you know, that speaks volumes. It's like, that's all they respect is violence. That's all they respect mm -hmm. is, you know, a guy who's able to back up what he says with X, Y, and Z. And, mm -hmm. you know, and in the world today, you see what's going on. It's craziness out here, but it's craziness oh. what's going on in the world. So it's like, I bite my lip a hundred times a day. My lip is callous for biting my lip, <laughs> you know? Yeah, really yeah. Yeah. I told one guy like two weeks ago, I said, listen, I said, tonight you're going to go home, buddy. You're going to put your head on the pillow, say a prayer because you're able to put your head on the pillow because you, I just allowed it to happen. You don't realize it, but I did. You have a good <laughs> night now. And I said it just like that. And I laughed the whole way. I, I got into my car. I just busted out laughing. But I was like, These, you know, because you never know who you're talking to. You just no. never, that's why you got to treat people with respect and you got to treat people with kindness because you never know. Yeah, you know, you never know, especially uh, if you say it to the wrong person or whatever, man, they might come after you. I mean, yeah, exactly. it's a crazy world, you know what I mean? It's a crazy world out there. You, you got to treat everybody the way you want, want to be treated. You yeah. know, simple as that. You know, yeah. respect goes a long way. Yeah, you're right. And, uh, you know, to wrap up, too, I mean, do you have any final words on, on anything? I mean, I know you got your book to promote, but I mean, do you have any, uh, you know, anything that you want to leave the people with? All I can say is that understand this, you know. The only reason why it's a story at all is because I'm alive today. If I would have died 30 years ago instead of living, it wouldn't have been a story. I would have been a five-minute conversation in a bar somewhere. The whole idea is that if you're involved in this stuff, understand that it's never going to be a happy ending for you. Never. Just no. It's just the way it is. You know, you take, you, know, you take your most successful organized crime figure, and then you figure out how much money they made, and did they really ever enjoy it? Or did they rot in a jail cell or did they get killed with a gun in their hand in the street? And that's usually the outcome. That's usually the outcome, brother. And, you know, talking about it and seeing it on TV is a lot different than if it's you laying in that street. It's a big difference. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a big, big difference. <laughs> you know, and um, that's it. I really have nothing else to say, but I'm very grateful. That's that's the bottom line. I'm very yeah. grateful. Yeah, well, I'm grateful you came on and shared your story, man. I hey, man, it was really, it. really good to meet you, brother. It really was. Thank you for having me. And you know what? You reach out to me anytime, you gentlemen.
Well, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Andrew's got one hell of a story. He's been through a lot, but he's really changed his life a lot as well. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with someone that you think will enjoy this type of content. I got plenty more interviews like this coming in the future, and we've already recorded a lot of interviews in the past just like this one. So please hit subscribe if you want to get more like that. And I'll, of course, include Andrew's book in the video description. I highly recommend reading his book. It's a really important piece of mafia history. I really enjoyed it. And it really goes about what era he was in and the guys that he was around. I mean, it's really good. I mean, we didn't even cover his whole story, but in that book, he really goes into detail. If you want to support me and my clothing brand, I'll be sure to include that in the video description as well. I got t-shirts, hoodies, beanies, and sweats all on there. And I'll also bring up that with my other podcast that I do, A Lifetime of Mafia Tales, with my co-host, Colombo Mobster Salvatore Polisi. We got products on that same website as well. There's cards that you can purchase that were played with by a lot of high-level mobsters and other different guys as well associates and made men that would go on to be big mafia figures these cards were played with probably in the years 1972 but they're all on there 10 bucks a card and you can also get an autographed copy of sal's book that he wrote about his life the sinatra club at the end of this video you'll also see a mafia playlist pop up of all my other mafia related interviews that i've done please check them out if you enjoyed this one i know you'll enjoy all the ones that i did in the past thank you again so much for watching